Life in the North, an apocalyptic lit RPG, The System Apocalypse, Volume 1, written by Tao Wong, narrated by Nick Podell. Chapter 22 After we've sorted things out, I'm seated at the back of the truck, working on my status screen. Points allocated to Charisma. Class skills unlocked. Eight class skills available to be distributed. Would you like to do so? Would I? I feel a thrill shoot through me and I can't help but grin widely. Gadsby is riding Saber with permission as I get busy poking at the details, calling up information on the class skills. It's not as if I don't have a rough idea about them, not from the information I've already purchased and the hours of video footage in my mind. However, when I pull up the class skills box, there's another tab right next to it. Basic skills. Ali, what are these basic skills? They unlock at the same time? I page over to them immediately and grimace, flicking through the pages at a rush since the sheer volume is staggering. Power blow, sprint, first aid, mana dart, poison, elemental imbue. When I pull up the information, though, I'm less than impressed. Power blow. Effect. Physical attack deals 20% more base damage. Cost 25 mana. Sprint. Effect. User is able to move at a run 5% faster. Cost 10 mana per second. Elemental imbue. Effect. Imbue your weapon with an elemental effect of choice. Choice must be made upon purchase and may not be changed. Plus 10 elemental damage. Cost 30 mana per second. Not really. You could have bought them before. Ali turns to me, hands on his hips as he points. I blocked them so you couldn't see it because, well, they're shit. It's what they catch you with and keeps you powered down. Just a little bit of a boost, but never good enough to really challenge the patient, the smart, or the knowledgeable. I twitch at his words, hands wanting to reach out and strangle the little spirit. Instead, I pull a chocolate bar from my inventory and eat it, focusing on the now. He's not wrong, but this magic rabbit trick that he's doing is getting old. I force myself to breathe, thoughts thrumming with anger. We just talked about you keeping secrets from me. Ali pauses, looking me up and down, and then his face twitches. It does something I've never seen it do before, and for a moment I can't figure it out. When I do, I realize it's the closest thing to remorse I've seen on his face. Then he speaks. Yeah. You're right. Say again? I prod him. You're right, I said. I'm sorry. We agreed to tell the truth. i just been keeping this one for so long I forgot. Ali replies, and I grunt, anger still simmering but under control. I'm not happy, but at least he apologized, and done is done. I tab back to my class skills and finish up the chocolate, focusing on reading now. I'm not sure I'll be making all my choices immediately, but knowing what I have to work with is important. The Honor Guard class skills are broken into three separate tracks, with skills above each track a prerequisite to more powerful skills beneath. Each track aided the Guard in their regular duties as bodyguards, champions, and of course, shock troops for the army. The first track focused on the Honor Guard's soul-bound weapons, enhancing the potential and damage of each weapon. As I understood it, the options varied in this track slightly depending on the weapon's soulbound. Mana imbue added mana damage to the weapon, which bypassed all resistances. Blade strike extended the range of my weapon. Thousand blades created extra copies of my soulbound weapon for use, and Army of One combined all the above into a massive attack. The second track allowed the guard to be effective bodyguards. Two or one shared the damage a target received with the guard, while the body's resolve increased regeneration rates, letting the guard take more damage. Soul Shield allowed the guard to manifest a shield, while Sanctum created a location that stopped all attacks for a short period of time. The third track involved their ability to move and hit. Thousand Steps was a movement buff. Altered Space gave them enhanced inventory storage abilities, while Blink Step was a short-range line-of-sight teleportation ability. Perhaps the most interesting power was Portal. This allowed the guard to link two locations. Get a single guard with Portal in your back lines, and he could drop an army on you. Or a nuke. 
Shield Transference Enhanced Soul Shield, allowing users to absorb a portion of any attack to the shield in order to enhance their own soulbound weapons. Greater Detection allowed the guard an awareness ability, much like Ali's, while Body Swap let the guard swap places with predetermined targets, no matter the distance. Unfortunately, as I prod the skills, I realize that some of them are still locked. Looks like, at least for now, the first two levels are the only ones unlocked until I hit level 30. It's only at level 45 that I'd unlock the last tier, but even with that, I've got a ton of things to play with. I could just pick up a single level in everything and enhance a single other skill, but that might be a touch too simplistic. After all, I'm not entirely sure I need greater detection since I have Ali already for one, and ranged attacks with the sword seem interesting, but I've got guns for those. Decisions, decisions, decisions. As I stare at the information, I idly pull out another chocolate bar and chew on it, ignoring the conversations around me. I'll definitely need to talk to Ali about this at some point. When we get back to Carcross, I put away the information. The guards at the gate nod to us, waving us through, and we find Mrs. O'Keefe on gate duty by sheer coincidence. Another guard is hurried into the meeting hall, and the elder makes her way out slowly. Gadsby gives her the thumbs up, and she relaxes, and then straightens, as if a great load is taken off her. I hop down, smiling slightly as Jason does his best blasé teenager impression for his mum while bouncing on his toes slightly. His need to play it cool is obviously warring with his need to tell the story of what we did. Richard just smiles at Mrs. O'Keefe, who gives him a quick smile of gratitude back before she turns to her son, guiding him away. There's still time to get back if we wish, but at Elder Badger's and Gadsby's insistence, we decide to call it a day. For everyone else but the guards on the wall, the evening fast turns into a celebration, food and drink coming out in large quantities, an unlucky moose becomes the center of the celebration, its 20-foot body the feature of the evening. The night comes on us fast, and I spot even Mikito relaxing slightly through the night, sitting and chatting with a few other melee weapon users. They seem to be comparing weapons and techniques, animatedly discussing moves from their body gestures. Rachel has disappeared into one of the motel's rooms, dragging along Jason, and I idly wonder if it's romance or knowledge or a little of both that's being shared. As for Richard, well, as usual, he's the star of the show with people clustered around him, listening to him talk. From the looks the pair of women who sit at his feet have given him, I'm pretty sure he won't be sleeping alone tonight. Me? I ghost around the edges, doing my best to blend into the crowd. I watch them laugh and smile, and I wonder why. We destroyed a lair, killed a few monsters, but we're a fucking dungeon world. It's just one of a thousand, 10,000 that are going to crop up and we can't stamp them all out. Then again, just because I don't feel the party doesn't mean they shouldn't enjoy it. So I stay hidden, blending in. I do so well that I even get a minor notification. Skill acquired, camouflage, level one. It takes skill to disappear in a crowd. After a while, I realize I can't even give a damn to put up a face for them all anymore. I head out, leaving Saber and my teammates behind, sneaking out past the guards while dumping points into my class skills. There are a few things I definitely want. The rest can wait. A single point first into a few areas. Class skills acquired. Mana imbue, level one. Soulbound weapon now permanently imbued with mana to deal more damage on each hit. Plus 10 base damage, mana, will ignore armor and resistances. Mana regeneration reduced by 5 mana per minute permanently. Class skills acquired. Blade Strike, level 1. By projecting additional mana and stamina into a strike, the Eritrean Honor Guard's soulbound weapon may project a strike up to 10 feet away. Cost 40 stamina plus 40 mana. Class skills acquired. Thousand steps, level one. Movement speed for the honor guard and allies are increased by 5% while skill is active. This ability is stackable with other movement-related skills. Cost 20 stamina plus 20 mana per minute. Class skills acquired. Altered space, level one. 
The Honor Guard now has access to an extra-dimensional storage location of 10 feet cubed. Items stored must be touched to be willed in and may not include living creatures or items currently affected by auras that are not the Honor Guards. Mana regeneration reduced by 5 mana per minute permanently. I'll stick close to the town and keep quiet, but there's no better way to test my new class skills than on a live opponent. Ali, the Thousand Steps skill doesn't seem that great to me. I converse with the invisible spirit who is working hard on looking out for threats. The night is the time for stealth predators, and even though his higher level means he can pick out more of them, we're still underleveled for this region, at least in terms of actual levels, which unfortunately dictate Ali's abilities. It's stackable and affects your vehicles, boyo. Think about what a platoon, each with a single use of that, is like. Additional points widen the range, too, and increase the speed bonus. There are movement specialists in the guard whose main job is to help get the guard where they need to be, Ali replies, and I nod slowly. So, not as useful for me, but I wonder what the interaction is going to be like with Makito's own speed skills. She's frightening enough as it stands. My first victim of the night is a slow-moving, dark-shelled creature that resembles a turtle, if the turtle had spikes in its shell and two heads. I ghost up next to it and cut down fast, beheading the first head with a snick. The second retreats and the spikes flash out, forcing me to dodge. When I step back in to attack, I'm surprised that the blows it catches even on its shell seem to do damage, leaving deep gouges in the armor. Fighting the creature is strange. I have to watch out for its second head as it comes in and out, but at the same time, any of its spikes can thrust out at any moment. After the first few passes, I begin to target the spikes themselves as they rotate out, chopping them off with the blade before I finally boot the creature hard enough to make it flip over. Unfortunately, without its spikes to push it up again, it's stuck and its ending comes fast. The moment it dies, I loot it and then stick the entire corpse in my altered space. That done, I take a moment to actually take a look at my sword again. Now this was more like it. Tier 2 Sword, soul-bound personal weapon of an Eritrean honor guard. Base damage 63, durability not applicable, personal weapon. Special abilities plus 10 mana damage, blade strike. Hunting down the next creature takes a while, as it seems even the monsters around here have begun to grow wary of the town. My next target actually finds me, swooping down from the trees and nearly tearing my eyes out. If I hadn't been wearing my helmet, it would have. As its first strike fails to get a proper hold of my head, the owl takes wing and I get my chance to test out blade strike. The quick draw and focused explosive strike leaves me tired as mana rushes through the blade, filling it and extending the slash in a diagonal across the sky. It mostly misses the owl, only a small section of the strike clipping a wing, but it's enough to send it flipping through the air to land awkwardly on the ground. I stride forward, triggering my ability again and again as I get the timing of the activation down. It doesn't take long to reduce the poor creature to mangled pieces of meat, which is good because I can feel the strain this strike takes on me. Definitely not a skill to be used too often. Exhaling, I stretch and loot the body, leaving the mangled remains behind this time. Not much eating there for sure. Satisfied, I head back to Carcross. As little sleep as I need, I do need some. Sneaking back in isn't much harder than leaving, neither the ditch nor the wall a huge obstacle. They definitely need more defenses. Once inside, I flick my hand up, calling access to my status screen as I dump a few points into perception and luck, leaving five more for use later when I need a boost. That done, I finally call up my status screen. Status screen. Name, John Lee. Class, Eritrean Honor Guard. Race, human, male. Level, 16. Titles, Monsters Bane. Redeemer of the Dead. Health, 790. Stamina, 790. Mana, 630. Status, normal. Attributes, strength, 52. Agility, 74. Constitution, 79. Perception, 30. 
Intelligence, 63. Willpower, 63. Charisma, 16. Luck, 15. Skills. Stealth, 6. Wilderness Survival, 4. Unarmed Combat, 6. Knife Proficiency, 5. Athletics, 5. Observe, 5. Cooking, 1. Sense Danger, 5. Jury Rigging, 2. Explosives, 1. Blade Mastery, 7. PAV Combatics, 5. Energy Rifles, 5. Meditation, 5. Mana Manipulation, 2. Energy Pistols, 3. Dissembling, 3. Eritrean Blade Mastery, 1. Lip Reading, 2. Manipulation, 1. Camouflage, 1. Class Skills, Mana Blade, 1. Blade Strike, 1. Thousand Steps, 1. Altered Space, 1. Spells, Improved Minor Healing, 1. Improved Mana Dart, 1. Enhanced Lightning Strike, Perks, Spirit Companion, Level 16, Prodigy, Subterfuge, Not Applicable. Chapter 23 The next morning I'm seated on Saber and waiting for everyone to get up. I'm still riding the high of getting my class skills back, and I just can't wait to go out again. It feels like I've finally been let loose. And if I had my say, I'd be out hunting monsters to really test myself. Instead, I've got to wait for the team, and of course, the usual traffic that needs us to bring them along. I can't help but feel a little resentful. It's not even as though we're getting any experience from this. I force myself to calm down again, going back over my status sheet and my remaining class skill points. The increase in damage from mana imbue was amazing, though the reduction in regeneration rates from it and altered space could be worrisome if I ever started using magic more. Before I selected it, I could regenerate my entire pool in ten minutes, which, considering most fights took less than a minute to finish, was quite pointless to worry about. On the other hand, in a longer battle, I'm sure that kind of regeneration rate could be important, though that's why the guard didn't rely on magic entirely either. The system might make high-tech weaponry somewhat less useful than you'd think, but it still was a powerful equalizer. On the other hand, while neither of the first couple of levels were that interesting to me, the Soul Shield class skill was certainly tempting. Being able to project a shield was a powerful ability in any fight. That meant I'd have to put the points in for the preceding skills at some point. Of course, I could just hold off on spending the points till I reach the requisite levels, though that might take a while. Better probably to use it now and get the benefits immediately. Decisions, decisions, decisions. When the convoy is ready to roll out, I finally pull myself away from my thoughts, having only paid the barest of attention to what is going on around me. The road, however, isn't the place to be thinking deep thoughts. Around towns, the levels range between 10 to 20 these days, at least for the first few kilometers. It's only a few kilometers out that the range starts heading up, hitting as much as 50 before dropping again. Unfortunately, this world isn't a game, and while monsters have their preferred hunting grounds, there is nothing stopping them from moving to a new location, and we've run into higher-level monsters in weird locations before. As a group, we could take anything below level 60 if it's alone, but we've got hanger-ons. All that said and done, it's still no surprise, then, that the journey into Whitehorse is pretty quiet. I make sure to collect the bodies of the monsters we do encounter into my altered space, winking at the party as I do so. I do have to leave the weird half-reptile, half-bird creature on the ground, though, since it's just too big to fit. Somehow, it makes sense that the first sign of trouble comes at the gates. A pair of Roxley's guards are waiting, and I've been around them enough to know what happy looks like on a tree gnaw, and they aren't. Adventurer Lee, Lord Roxley wishes a word with you. Immediately. The first guard speaks even before I come to a stop as the gate rolls aside. My eyes narrow, but I follow, waving the others off as they start to enter as well. This should be interesting. Adventurer Lee. Roxley speaks as soon as I arrive. 
My eyes sweep to the right, clocking Capstan and another Yarek, and then I turn back to Roxley, my heart speeding up slightly, but not for a good reason. Something's up, and I definitely don't like it. Lord Roxley? First fist Capstan? I greet the two that I know and look towards the third, but get no reply. Okay. We have a few questions for you, adventurer. A few days ago, we spoke about the Yarek's plans. I understand you spoke with the First Fist soon after to confirm this information, Roxley says, his voice cool and authoritative. Sort of. I spoke with you, certainly. And then I spoke with the First Fist about potential problems, I answer, eyes narrowing and Ali floating next to me is silent. Tell me, why did you do so? Roxley continues in that same tone, and I look over to Capstan, noting he hasn't moved at all. I was trying to make sure nothing bad happened. I'm getting a feeling something did. Really? And you spoke with no one about their plans for buying property in the city, Roxley says. I might have told my team, I reply and then pause, remembering something. And Fred and Minion, um, Eric, did you plan for that information to be used against the Yarek? Says Roxley, and I note the other Yarek is watching me really closely. No, and I'm done now. I've answered that question a dozen different ways, and now I'd like to know what the hell is going on, I reply, glaring at them. In answer, the other Yarek turns and speaks to Capstan. He's saying you're telling the truth, Ali says to me in my mind, and I shoot him a look. New ability. I've got access to the common languages and dialects in the system now. I nod and keep my face bland, watching the three as they exchange looks before Capstan gives Roxley a small nod. Once he does, Roxley says, The buildings, all the buildings the Yarek purchased were burnt down early this morning. As you were the only one we spoke to about their plans, we are forced to presume the leak came from you. And the results, whether intentional or not, are from your actions. I blink and then look at them, a hand coming up. Look, I didn't... It does not matter what you intended, Adventurer Lee. Your actions are what are judged here, and your actions brought about great loss to the Yarek. And myself. That you did not intend the results is perhaps just as bad. Roxley shakes his head and waves his hand, dismissing me. I stare at him, and then at Capstan, who has not said a word to me this entire time. I can feel the rage building in me, at being so casually dismissed for the way they are acting. I can feel the anger at being treated like this for just trying to help, but I keep control because they are right. I fucked up. I thought I knew what I was doing, but I didn't. Stupid, stupid, stupid John. Never really good at anything important. I walk out of the building, not even bothering to go to the shop. I swing Sabre to 4th Street, and it takes barely five minutes to get to the burnt-out husks of the buildings that take up the entire street the Yerrick purchased. I look at the burnt ashes still smoldering slightly, and I wonder how they managed to keep it contained, managed to stop it from spreading throughout the city. Nice, isn't it? A voice comes from behind me, and I turn around, seeing Minion lounging against a lamppost. What? I reply. Looks like someone decided the Minotaurs shouldn't get what we humans built for free, replies Minion, smirking. I find myself snarling, crossing the distance in a blink. I don't think he was expecting me to move so fast, but then again, he hasn't ever seen one of us let loose either. I want to grab him, but I stop myself, getting right in his face while I snarl. You! You did this, didn't you? Me? What would I do? Minion smirks, not backing down. I wouldn't dare do anything like this. I'm just a minion. I growl at him, but force the anger back, hands trembling slightly with contained rage. I make myself step away, and Minion's smirk grows wider. You look so unhappy. Did your elf lover tell you off? Did your pet monsters not like you anymore? He taunts, waving his hand out to the fires. Perhaps they're beginning to understand that the real humans don't want them here. John, Ali begins, but I tune the asshole out. Shut up, Minion. 
Now! My eyes narrow and my fists clench as I work to keep my anger tamped down. I guess it's no surprise human women like Luthien turn you down. What with you being a- One second, I'm a step away from him, my hands by my side, and the next, I have him by the throat and he's smashed against the wall of the building behind him, crushed against it. A small part of me holds back, just enough so that he doesn't die immediately. Shut up. All I want to know is who did this. Fuck you, monster lover. Minion grates out beneath my hand, and I start closing my grip, choking him out. I watch his face turn purple, rage tinting my vision while I smile. I watch as he claws at my armored hand, kicking at me feebly. I watch as his struggles weaken as he begins to die, and I smile. The blow that catches my outstretched arm catches me by surprise. I stagger back, hand opening by reflex to release, and then Mikito is in front of me, Naginata between us. She is crouched low, watching me like she watches the monsters. John! Richard shouts, and I realize he's been shouting at me for minutes now. He's panting, the huskies spread out before him in a defensive formation, all of them bearing their fangs at me. Behind, Rachel has her hands raised, ready to cast a spell. What? I grate out, anger still threatening to spill out as I massage my arm. You were killing him, Richard says, his voice shaky. I look at the slumped over vomiting minion and the anger flares again. I take a half step unconsciously towards the body and Mikito shifts to block me, leveling the Naginata at me. John, you need to calm down. You can't do this, Richard says, his voice low and soothing, trying to calm me down. Mental influence resisted. Son of a bitch is trying to charm me, to calm me. Fuck that. I almost take a step to him. I actually do before I can stop myself. The huskies are all growling at me, and Rachel looks pale and so scared she's about to throw up. I can feel the anger in me, a hair's breadth from being unleashed, and I look between them all, all my friends staring at me as if I'm the monster. I snarl, grabbing hold of what is left of my self-control and go to Saber in silence. I need to kill something, and there's nothing in town that I can kill, or should kill at least. Two in the morning, and I can already see the glimmers of light on the horizon. Faint now, though I know in a few weeks' time it will be as bright as day, even at this hour. The guards do not stop me as I drive into town, though they watch me with care. I understand their hesitation. It's why I am making the trip now. Three days now, I've done this. Coming in late at night to sell my earnings to the shop, and then visit the nocturnal Zev. There, it provides me with the quick fixes that I need for Saber and takes a look at the remains that I bring, helping to make arrangements for the pieces that it does not want. Three days while I live in the fort by myself, hunting and killing, letting the anger cool. I'm tense, waiting for the other shoe to drop, but I know it's better for me not to be in town, not to be around directly, at least for a bit. A lot of things have changed, but trying to kill a man for calling you names isn't exactly civilized behavior. I was just so angry at him, at Roxley and Capstan, at the idiots who started the fire. I draw a deep breath and exhale, forcing myself to focus. Zev's first. No reason to go to the shop. My inventory is now large enough to store a few days' worth of loot. Unfortunately, my altered space storage isn't that large, and thus the nightly visits. The doors to Zeb's parking lot are open and I swing in, the doors swinging shut behind me. I step out, looking around me as Ali floats beside me, staring intensely at a screen only he can see. If I had to guess, it's probably more reality TV. I don't understand his addiction, but it keeps him occupied, which is all that I need. Zev. I greet the mechanic, turning to where it lurks in the shadows above me. An angry chitter lets me know it dislikes being found out again. I then turn to the other visitors, raising an eyebrow slightly, my voice cooling a touch. Amelia? Lieutenant Veer? John? The ex-constable smiles at me, running a hand through her short-cut blonde hair in absent thought. Amelia has filled out further, wide in the shoulders and stocky, she moves with a lithe grace that belies her bulk, 
and with her new bulk are new levels. I see you know Lieutenant Veer. By sight, I acknowledge having spotted the lieutenant in Roxley's presence a number of times. I'd like to talk to you about the Yerrick and the buildings. Amelia continues to smile at me, though she has crossed to stand closer to me. Only a small hand span away from reaching out to touch me, in fact. Instincts honed in combat tell me hers and Veer's positioning to my left are not by accident. They're treating me like a potential threat. Lord Roxley has requested I aid in the investigation due to my previous career. I nod slightly, flicking a glance at Veer and then back to her, keeping my voice level. A little resentment flickers, burns away at my control, but I keep it tamped down. Ask away. I have nothing to hide. If Zev doesn't mind. Zev scurries down and prods me to get off Saber, rolling the mecha into its shop while I turn to the two. What follows is a pleasant interrogation, one filled with all kinds of cordiality, but it's an interrogation nonetheless. She is good, though, honing in on any hesitation or dissembling on my part to clarify things, pulling out details about my meetings with Roxley, Capstan, Fred, and Minion, and my conversations with my party with consummate ease. She even asks about my last confrontation with Minion. She takes notes constantly on a little paper notebook, Veer standing behind her and silently observing our interactions. Well, that should be it. Thank you, John. I hesitate to ask, but you will be around, will you not? Amelia says, and I shrug. For now? The hunting is good and Zev's the only mechanic who can fix Saber for a few hundred miles, I reply. And you're staying at? She continues, jotting my affirmation. The fort. Carcross Crossing. I answer, and she smiles again, closing the notebook with a snap. Problems with the party? She tilts her head, quirking her lips and inviting me to spill. The interview isn't over, boyo, Ali sends to me, even as he continues to stare at his screen, acting as if he's ignoring us entirely and probably not fooling anyone. I'm enjoying the peace. It's been interesting hunting alone again, I reply, smiling back at her, though the smile is strained. All politeness no warmth. I've not talked to my party, not discussed what happened. I think they need time, and I surely do. Time to resolve how I felt, or didn't feel, about nearly killing Minion. That was perhaps the worst part, that I still couldn't bring myself to regret what I did. What difference was there in killing a human or monster? I've killed sentient creatures before. I've killed non-sentient creatures. They're all just grist for the mill of blood and experience. Yet, I should feel bad about it, shouldn't I? Bad about killing someone for just calling me names, which really is what it amounts to right now. I don't have real proof that he was the perpetrator. At least I know I feel somewhat ashamed at almost attacking the party. Amelia is staring at me as I think, before jerking her head to Veer and the two turn to leave together. Well, we'll find you if we have any more questions. Of course. I reply and watch her go. A good woman, trying to do an impossible job. I'm glad Roxley pulled her in. It'll make finding the parties responsible a little easier, though I guess they could just ask the system. Everything is for sale in the shop after all. Maybe they even have, and all this is just a show, a way of appeasing the humans that a proper investigation is being done. Either way, that's not my problem. Not anymore. I watch them leave, and when they are gone, only then do I turn to the last set of shadows and call out, You can come out now. Sally chuckles, walking out from where she's been hiding. Damn, how'd you find me? I have my ways, I smirk. Truthfully, it was Ali. As he grows in strength, even lower-level stealth methods are falling to his scans. What's this about? Zev tells me you've been bringing in the bodies of your kills. I thought I might come and look for myself. It knows a bit about alchemy, but really? She shrugs, and I nod, walking to the waiting platform. I pull the bodies out, depositing them on the platform in quick order and arranging them for the alchemist. Sally pulls a knife from her inventory, prodding and pulling at the new bodies and dissecting them with quick, precise motions. She pulls and sets aside various organs and body parts as she goes, muttering to herself as she works. How are things? With the humans, I ask, curiously, 
Normally, our interactions are brief and to the point at her store. She pulls her head out from the gullet of a particularly big, scaled kill to call out, Tense. Very tense. Someone tried to firebomb Zev's place this morning, but the shops upgraded, so they failed. No one's bothered me, but I'm next to the center, so it'd take someone really dumb to try something. Now, if you don't mind. I leave her to it and find a seat, propping my feet up and waiting, pulling a chocolate bar from my inventory while I wait. An hour later, she emerges covered in blood and guts and flicks a hand to send me an itemized list of what she wants to buy and for how much. I eye it for a second and then send Ali to dicker with her, as if I'd know the price of a pair of lizard balls. As I watch them, my eyes drift shut and I let them. I'll just rest my eyes for a moment. When I open them again, Saber is right beside me, nice and shiny, and the gate doors are open, trucks driving in to pick up the meat. Jim is there, nodding to me as I slowly stand up and stretch. Jim, I greet him and he grunts, looking me up and down before he walks over, only the slight pause at the beginning betraying his hesitation. John, he offers his hand and I take it. How are you doing? I ask him, looking the man over. He's raised a few levels since we last spoke, and he looks fitter, though his shoulders are curved in more, and he looks even more tired than before. Good, he replies, and I raise an eyebrow. He looks me over and shrugs. I'm good. Haven't lost anyone in three days now. I nod slowly. Yeah, the monsters are stabilizing a bit, though the changes continue. He grunts, spitting to the side as I mention that. Changes. Lots of those. Can't recognize some of the trails anymore. Can't even recognize some of the land. About two kilometers from here, we found a new lake. When he mentions that, I can hear the sadness in his voice. I look at him then, and he smiles at me wryly, shaking his head. No use complaining, I guess, but I can see how the land changing can be hard for the First Nations. How do you deal with the land you grew up on, that your ancestors grew up on, changing under your very feet? transforming into something you can't recognize. How do you deal with the fact that there's nothing you can do about it? Then again, perhaps I'm being too patronizing. It's not as if the dams, the national parks, or the lack of land claims haven't done the same. Truthfully, I have no answer to his concerns. In the end, we just stand and watch the rest of his team load up the last of the bodies to be sent for processing. He looks at me once more, opens his mouth to say something, then closes it before walking away. I guess neither one of us has anything useful to say to one another. John? Richard is seated on the porch of the fort as I pull up, petting Shadow as the other puppies gamble around the yard. Richard? I look around, not seeing any of the others. I'm alone. He spots my actions and waves me over to his seat. I groan as I put the kickstand down, getting off the mecca. Stupid brain, still thinking I should hurt when my health is all fixed up already. What's this about? I inquire as I walk over, slinging the rifle I took from Saber over my shoulder. Minion, the council, well, they wanted me to talk to you. Richard shifts uncomfortably and I nod slightly. No surprise, nearly killing someone was bound to have some ramifications. This isn't, well... This is what they agreed on, in the majority. I almost want to ask how he voted, but I push it aside. That kind of answer could end a friendship, and we're on shaky ground as it is. Go on. Promise not to kill the messenger. Richard glares at me, obviously not finding the joke funny. They aren't going to press charges. I snort at that, though Richard continues without stopping. But you're no longer welcome as a member of the council. They also... Well, they'd also like you to leave, but but they don't have the right or ability to enforce it. And Roxley probably doesn't give a damn, I finish for him. Sure, we had a jail, but considering most of those held there weren't particularly dangerous before the system change, the ones who survived the initial massacre had been returned to the populace. We didn't have the resources to staff it, and frankly, I'm not going to jail peacefully if they tried that shit. The matter hasn't been brought to Roxley's attention, as far as we know. He hasn't said anything to us, at least, Richard replies, and I nod. As I said, 
He probably doesn't give a damn. And you guys? The group? We're divided. We know why you did it, but John... Richard looks up from stroking Shadow, speaking firmly. You scared us. That anger? That rage? We've seen it before out there. We thought you had it under control, but you tried to kill a man. And I could swear you were about to kill us. I smile grimly, and I then tell him the truth. I almost did. Richard's hand that had been stroking Shadow stops for a moment at my revelation before he continues to pet her. I can't help but notice that the other pets have all focused on me, surrounding me without a sound. So you don't trust me anymore? We do. We trust you. We just don't trust your... anger. Richard struggles, and I laugh, shaking my head and wave him away. We... forget it, man. I get it. Don't worry about it. I cut him off, pointing to his truck and dismissing him with a flick of my hand. Better this way anyway. John, Richard opens his mouth and I wave him away again, suddenly tired. Fuck this and fuck emotions. You guys take care, all right? I get up and walk into the fort, shutting the door behind me and walking to the bathroom. I need food and then some sleep. Then it'll be time to kill things again. It's for the best, really. This way, I need only focus on one thing getting stronger. Chapter 24 I step out of my shower, reveling in the feeling of being clean for the first time in a few days. I stretch, shifting my weight forward before walking into my room to look for something to wear. That's when I remember that nothing I own fits me now. John? Lana comes around the corner, red hair leading the way as she leans around the doorway and smiles when she sees it's actually me. As always, it's like someone turned on the sun, colors brightening when she comes in and smiles. Lana? I nod to her and reach out to my inventory, pulling it open to grab the clothing I bought from the shop. I really have to remember to buy some casual clothing soon. Under Armour, while comfortable, isn't exactly relaxing. Sorry, I didn't mean to disturb you. She looks me over again before she turns away. I'll be upstairs. I sigh really not wanting to have that conversation. It's why I chose to come midday to the house when I figured the group would be out doing their thing. Still, now that I'm here, I won't run. I get dressed, then come upstairs to find Lana nursing a cup of coffee and another waiting for me. Thanks, I say as I sip on it. How are you doing, John? We've been worried about you, Lana states, peering at me as if she could read my mind if she tried hard enough. I'm fine. I answer her automatically. Really? Yeah, I am. I begin to get irritated, wondering why she's pushing the matter. John, it's okay to be angry. It's okay to be upset, you know? I'm fine, I say again, stressing the words. So, Richard tells me you're staying at the crossing? Lana asks, looking me over again with those blue eyes. Yeah, I am, I say. Pass the word on to Richard, will you? Let the council know I'm not accepting visitors anymore. Not without an appointment and payment. She frowns, puzzling through my meaning before she gets it. No more free experience taking the fort away from me and then giving it back. Why? It's my home now. I don't want strangers tramping through it unannounced, I explain. You intend to stay there then? Yes. It's a lot closer to level appropriate hunting grounds. I sip my coffee, looking at her over the rim. You know, you're not the first, Lana states, swirling the cup before her. Hmm? You're a classic case, full of anger and resentment with the world, unable to process what has happened, so you've just turned it into anger and more anger. Now, when it starts getting too much, you pull away from everyone who cares about you. She shakes her head, red hair swishing around her face, and smiles sadly. You're not the first even if you have been more constructive than most others. I swallow the last of the coffee, the heat burning its way down my throat as I stand up. I'm fine, Lana. Drop it. No. No, you're not. You tried to kill a man because you were angry, and now, rather than deal with your loss of control, you're running. Lana moves to touch me, and I shrink away, dropping the cup on the table. Lana stops moving immediately, staring at me. I didn't intend to kill him. If I wanted him dead, he would be. 
I spit out, my voice trembling. I just wanted, I wanted him to stop, to shut up, to go away. I wanted it to burn in the thousand hells for what it did. I just wanted it to stop. I can feel the fragile set of controls I've managed to put in place begin to creak, begin to give way. You don't even know, do you? Lana whispers softly, pity in her eyes now. I walk out then. I don't have an answer for her. I don't think I have an answer for myself. If I stay here any longer, I think I might just hurt her to make her stop looking at me like that. John Ali starts, and I hold a finger up to the spirit. Not a word. Not a word, or else I'll dump your ass back in the spirit world and leave it there. I snarl, getting on saber and heading out. I need to kill something. I barely slow down at the guard post, gunning through as I head south. Find me something to kill. A lot of somethings, I grate out, eyes burning as I push the bike. Right, um... Ali floats beside me, flicking his hand around, and then suddenly, a small map shows up in front of me, just translucent enough for me to see through. I see the blinking dot that is me and a whole series of others. Blood. Violence. Death. It's so simple when I'm fighting. When I'm in the midst of kicking ass. I feel the mutated wolf bite into my shoulder, teeth tearing into the flesh beneath, and I grab hold of it with my other hand, ripping it free. The wolf growls, and I throw it into a tree, calling forth my blade and channeling mana to send a wave of force outwards. The blow cuts it into half, and I glance at the small puncture holes in my shirt, watching as the wounds begin to close. More, I whisper, walking further in. Behind me, Saber sits unused. More, Ali. Find me something tougher, something harder. No, John. Put Saber on and we'll talk, but this is stupid. Ali floats in front of me, arms crossed. This isn't even training anymore. This is suicide. I ordered you to do it, I hiss, raising my hand. No. I flick my hand outwards, calling forth the companion screen and then dismiss the still defiant spirit. Fine then. I'll find them myself. I drop points into two or one. The bodies resolve and finally greater detection, ignoring the notifications about the skills. I watch as a small mini-map flares into life in the top right, small colored dots indicating monsters. I concentrate, and the gray, green, and blue ones disappear, leaving it blank. Frustrated, I focus, and the blue ones reappear, and then I start jogging as clouds gather overhead and the first signs of rain start appearing. Fine. If there aren't any greater threats around, I'll just kill my way to one. Blood. I slide my sword in the lizard's neck, ripping outwards and blood flies. I feel another bite into my leg, but the feeling is remote, the pain a shadow of what it should be. I kill it with a flick of my hand, sword appearing and disappearing, a head torn off. Pain. The stone bear lands a paw on my shoulder, throwing me into the air and gouging out a chunk of flesh. The creature is chipped and shattered, stone flesh carved from its limbs and chest smashed in by pommel strikes. I roll and come up on my feet, free hand rising as mana darts smash into the body, tearing chunks of stone from its chest. The bear staggers, the last dart finding its heart and it falls dead. I watch it crumble, just another wet boulder in the rain. Death. The horn pierces my stomach, the creature lifting and throwing me with the same motion. I finish my attack as it does so, sliding my blade into the back of its skull as I land, driving all the breath from my body. I struggle to pull forth a stamina potion to cast a healing spell, but that cold, empty place that I've existed in finally crumbles. Blood. Pain. Death. Blood rushes from my open wounds, mixing with the rain. Countless hours of running from one battle to another, pushing pain aside and laying death around me. Blood runs, and pain overwhelms me, and death comes, but at least the anger is gone. The emotions, gone. Just a nice, floating emptiness with old voices from the past. Is that it? Is that all you can say? How can you be so cold? Luthien the last night before I leave when I tell her to get out, 
when I tell her we're over. Cold. Yes, that's me. My body is shivering, cold from the blood loss as I stare up into the sky watching the lights shift. There's nothing more for me to do. Nothing I can do. We're all failures, Mikito now. Yes, but I failed a long time ago. I've never been good enough, smart enough, tough enough. Always the loser, always the outsider. 81%, so stupid. How are you going to be a doctor with such marks? Get me the cane. Maybe you'll learn this time. Another voice, my father's this time. I learned. I learned that it's never enough. Nothing is ever enough. You just keep going, just keep trying, just keep running, and you don't look back. Not ever. You tried to kill a man because you were angry, and now, rather than deal with your loss of control, you're running. Lana. Beautiful Lana who told me I'm not good enough for her. She's right, though. I never was good enough for anybody. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. The pain has receded and I can't feel my body much anymore. Can't feel the rain hitting my face. I've run as far as I can. Done all I can. I feel my eyes drift close and I smile. Maybe I can rest now. Chapter 25. I wake up and pain comes with it. Pain from my numerous wounds. I gasp, drawing a deep shuddering breath as pain eats at me, enveloping my mind. I can't think, not really, and so I pull a potion out, drinking it down and feeling it take effect. Mana coursing through my body and stitching wounds close, replacing lost blood. I should be dead. I was bleeding out and I should be dead. Memories of blood-soaked hours, of killing and killing and killing in an attempt to run away from my memories, my feelings, my failures, come back to me. Sadness catches me, grips me, and I curl up, wondering why I can't even do this properly. Stupid, stupid, stupid. I feel tears leaking out and I rub at them, refusing to cry. I don't cry. I never cry. You don't ever let them see you cry, not ever. Like everything else in my life, I fail. I sit there amidst a clearing filled with the dead and I cry. For my father that I'll never meet and tell off again to his face. For the millions that have died, for a world destroyed. For myself and all the times I've never been good enough. The sun begins to set by the time I wake up again, the dead congealing and rotting around me. My wounds are closed and I'm healed, in body, if not mind. I roll a bit and a soft gasp makes me look up and I realize that I'm not alone. John, Lana bends down, offering me her hand and I blink, staring at her. How are you here? Why? Ollie contacted me before you dismissed him, before you got out of range, told me you were out of control. I couldn't find anyone else, so... She waves around her, and I see she's brought her pets with her, all of them. I look around and shiver, realizing how far I've come. Hours of running and fighting has taken me far away from Whitehorse into zones that I have no right to be in, nor should she. You shouldn't have come. You shouldn't have run, Lana points out, and I feel that coil of anger rise up again. I try to fight it, but I don't have to. It gutters and dies. My body, my soul, too tired right now. This, I, I try to find the words and fail. It's okay. You don't have to say anything. Not right now. She waves to her animals and they come up to her. We should leave anyway. It's getting late. I nod slowly and then turn to survey the small clearing I'm in. I walk along the bodies of the monsters I've killed, spotting the monstrous horned alpha that I've fought and loot it before dropping the body into storage. My hand hovers for a moment before I sigh, waving and recalling the little monster. Ali reappears, foot tapping and arms crossed in front of me, glaring. Before he can speak, I raise a finger. Not a word, Ali. You've done stupid shit too. Right. We should head back. Plot me the best way back, will you? I instruct Ali and then flick a glance to my side. 
Can do. We picking up the loot on the way? I give a nod. No reason to waste it, after all. Though you might want to head this way, a blue arrow appears. First, there's a stream there. Might help to wash your face, baby. Strangely enough, it's comforting, the teasing. No anger, though I do send him a warning glare that reminds him not to push it. I change directions, following his arrow as Lana falls in behind us and exchanges greetings with Ali, her pets staying close by. I sigh, pulling up my notifications while we move. With Ali back, I know I don't have to wade through the idiotic mess, so I pull up the good ones. Class skill acquired. Two are one. Level one. Effect. Transfer 10% of all damage from target to self. Cost, five mana per second. Class skill acquired. The body's resolve. Level one. Effect. Increase natural health regeneration by 10%. Ongoing health status effects reduced by 20%. Mana regeneration reduced by five mana per minute permanently. Well, that explains that. Luck. Pure luck that I had to choose body's resolve to acquire greater detection. It was the only reason that I can think of that I had survived the giant hole in my stomach, the bleeding stopping before I died out while my body regenerated the damage. Pure frigging luck. Finding the stream, I wash my face and arms, cleaning off the blood that I can get at before finally giving up. I'm going to have to replace the entire damn skin suit armor. It's so torn up, I might as well be naked. When I stand, I notice Lana isn't watching the woods but me, and I give her a tired grin. She smiles again before looking aside. Cleaned up, I get back on track and head for the nearest body while flicking through my other notifications. Class skill acquired, greater detection, level one. Effect, user may now detect system creatures up to one kilometer away. General information about strength level is provided on detection. Stealth skills, class skills, and ambient mana density will influence the effectiveness of this skill. Mana regeneration reduced by five mana per minute permanently. Ali, did I just reduce my total mana regeneration by 20 points? I grimace doing the math quickly. Mana regeneration is based off my willpower, so I just reduced my entire regeneration rate by a third. Put another way, it'd take nearly half again as long to fill my mana tank, nearly 15 minutes. In a fight, that's forever. I guess I know where some of my saved points are going when I get my next level up. Impressive, Lana murmurs as we come to the next body and I nod slowly. How the hell did I get that body up there? And that body is in two parts. It looks like I tore the poor thing into two with my bare hands. Well, marveling at the death and chaos isn't getting me anywhere. I get back to looting, jumping up first and then going for the torn apart bodies. Class skill learnt, frenzy. Due to repeated actions, you have learnt a class skill outside of your class. Effect, when activated, pain is reduced by 80%, damage increased by 30%, stamina regeneration rate increased by 20%, Mana regeneration rate decreased by 10%. Frenzy will not deactivate until all enemies have been slain. User may not retreat while Frenzy is active. Okay, now that's just trolling me, I mutter, staring at the next blurb as I walk through the forest towards my next kill site. Still, a skill is a skill, and at least this one didn't have an ongoing cost. One last notification, then. Level up. You have reached level 17 as an Eritrean Honor Guard. Stat points automatically distributed. You have eight free attribute points and one class skill point to distribute. Right. Dumping five into willpower immediately, then. I guess going on a rampage was good for one thing. I smile grimly to myself, coming up to the next corpse. Ah, shit. I'm out of space, I point out as I stare at the corpse of the bear. Let me take a look. Ali disappears for a second, and then suddenly bodies start getting dumped out from my altered space through a floating doorway, the grunting spirit appearing behind the last dumped body. Right, those are crap. Grab the bear. That's so weird, mutters Lana as she watches the bodies just appear out of thin air. Having the spirit pays for itself once more, since I still don't have a clear grasp of what everything is worth. Too damn much to learn and not enough time. As I think about it, I can feel the tightening in my chest, the sudden pressure as I think of all the things I need, I want to do. I stop, 
closing my eyes and force myself to breathe. Just a few seconds, just a few moments to still my mind. One step at a time. That's all I can do. That's all I've ever been able to do. Don't worry about the future or the past. Just focus on the present. I feel a hand close on mine, gripping it tight and squeezing, and I open my eyes to meet Lana's. She smiles at me, and I nod slowly, forcing a breath out. Right then. One step at a time, and the first step is to get the rest of these bodies and back to Saber. At a nod from Lana, I start jogging. In, out. In, out. I exhale, seated in the middle of the fort, meditating. It's noon already, the sun shining down on me as I sit in my bedroom. I slept like the dead when I got back, and I'm dirty, smelly, and bloody, but for a moment, I feel more like myself. Lana tried to get me to go back to the house, but I refused. There's a talk there that needs to be finished, but I need this time alone. In the calm that meditating gives me, I slowly prod at my feelings, slowly test them out. Rage, of course, always that. So much anger. At my father, at the bullies from childhood, at Luthien, the system, the monsters, myself. The list goes on and on. It's cooler now, but it's still there, just this churning sea of anger that colors all my emotions. Not repressed or compartmentalized like I thought, more like damned with all the boxes of my other emotions floating in it, except the dam is broken and leaking. Next emotion, grief. For a mother that I never knew, a sister that I loved, a world that was. It's a gut punch that refuses to stop hurting, to go away, always gnawing at my control. Resentment at Ali for using me, at the council for never saying thank you, at the citizens for just lying back and letting the world roll over them. Pressure to do something, to save people, to prove that I'm not a failure to myself or to my father. Fear of a system that wants to kill me, that I'm not doing enough, that the next fight is my last. Frustration that I didn't choose right, that there's not enough time, not enough money. So many emotions, so few of them good. I sit there and open the boxes that I've shoved away, finding time to let myself feel, let myself watch and note before letting them get boxed away again, a little lessened, perhaps. It's a waste of a day, sitting here and feeling them, thinking about them, but I don't have a choice. I guess that's resentment again, for the wasted time doing this, for taking a moment to take care of myself, anger for thinking that I'm not worth it. I draw a deep breath, exhale and repeat, forcing myself to find that dispassionate peace again as I get derailed. Not the first time it has happened, probably not the last time it'll happen. I've put this off too long, pushing myself, because there wasn't anyone else, but that's not true either, is it? Pushing myself, because that's what I do. Not right now, though. No more judging, no more worrying. Just do what needs to be done. I'll deal with the world later. Right now, this is about me and finally, finally coming to terms. What is, is. And that includes me. This has been Life in the North, an apocalyptic lit RPG, The System Apocalypse, Volume 1, written by Tao Wong, narrated by Nick Podell, copyright 2017 by Tao Wong, production copyright 2018 by Tao Wong.